Yeah, so I'm visiting from Denver, Colorado. Uh, any of you make it out that way, let me know, and I'll take you up to the top of a hill and then talk at you while you're panning for breath. It's my conversational gambit. I am at a bit of a loss for it here, so hopefully I have some things that you're interested in hearing about. Uh, really quick, uh, a lot of times I get in a room and people say, so what, what's MITRE? What's MITRE? Uh, is there a French company? I have to tell them a little bit of background. So for those of you who don't know, no, uh, MITRE is a uh, nonprofit R&D organization that uh, does R&D specifically for the federal government, a whole bunch of different parts of the government. Uh, personally, I am uh, based within the Human Language Technologies Group, so we've got a team of about 60 uh, researchers who are working on language processing of various stripes, uh, and my own team within that is a team that is particularly focused on um, kind of the intersection of deep learning and language processing, specifically for the point of uh, doing language understanding. So this notion of generalizing um, to kind of the intent behind an utterance, uh, a, 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 an article, uh, a sentence, and so forth, to understand what it really means rather than kind of the specifics of what was said. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of these things in more detail, of course, uh, but I just wanted to give you a bit of context on where the heck I'm coming from. So. Very briefly, we're going to kind of get into an example task for the types of things that um, we find really interesting with language processing. Because so I know we've, uh, I've had a really a lot of interesting conversations this morning with people from around Hopkins and a bunch of different areas of expertise. And it's pretty cool to see. There's lots of different um, world-leading research experts here who have a lot more in common than maybe you all realize you do. So there's some really interesting specialized hardware challenges that people are tackling. There's some, uh, undoubtedly, some of the best language processing talent in the entire world is concentrated here. And uh, maybe there's some interesting opportunities for you guys to get together and learn about each other's problems. And uh, you'll hear a bit about this Telluride workshop, which Hopkins takes a, an important um, leadership role within. Um, and maybe there's opportunities for you all to work together. So okay, so one of the tasks that uh, my team has worked on recently is kind of this broad task of understanding semantic similarity. So I said language understanding, it's kind of a sexy sounding term, you know, it'll get you some additional research dollars added to your grants if you tell people you're building a computer that can understand language, but what's it really mean? So the real idea, and this is actually something I think CLSP has um, heard about in the past, was uh, from Wei uh, Coco Zhu, um, she, put together a Semivel competition last year based around the idea of modeling semantic similarity in Twitter. So uh, understanding when two tweets mean the same or very similar thing is kind of this notion of paraphrase detection or uh, modeling of semantic similarity. And you can see some examples here that indicate, maybe give you some clues about why this is a difficult challenge, right? So uh, especially with Twitter, but of course with all sorts of different types of language, you're going to get misspellings, you're going to get uh, non-traditional uh, phrasings, you're going to get ungrammatical sentences, you're going to get things that leave a lot of t to the uh, imagination, but that are really easily understood by other people. So how does the computer look at this list of um, various tweets and understand that some of them are carrying some implicit meaning that's not stated, that is identical to the one on the left and the, maybe the ones on the bottom are not. And then, you know, ideally, if you can sort them in this order and draw like a tear off line, um, you can say everything above it is a paraphrase, everything below is not a paraphrase. This is a really valuable idea because you can use this for improving generalization in, say, text classifiers. You can use it to understand better ways to um, evaluate machine translation. So, you know, did you produce a sentence that's the right thing to produce um, in content rather than in, you know, specific uh, word features and so forth. So it's a big problem, and, uh, and in order to solve it, we tried many different things and kind of tried and true competition style. We threw everything that we knew how to do at this uh, task and wanted to see where were we going to get some benefit and where were some of the ideas um, not so useful. So I'm just going to very briefly kind of spin through a bunch of these things. But um, the first thing to know is that with machine translation, we've been, we've been arguing for decades about the right way to know if a translation is the right translation. Because you get someone, you get a human to sit there and write some sentences that look like viable translations, and your system produces one that's not an exact match for any of them, so you need a good way to find partial credit. People have argued a lot over the past couple of decades about what the right scoring mechanism is to evaluate these things. And so, um, 
Well, it turns out we actually have all of these different string matching metrics lying around in software that we wrote over a decade ago. Let's see what happens. We just pick it up and run it at this task and see if you know, the machine translation field has been doing a good job of evaluating. Um, I'm actually going to give you uh, a peek ahead to the end. This turned out to be the second best performing system that we built. And it by itself would have already, it would have won the competition if we had entered it as a standalone. So um, don't sleep on traditional uh, NLP is one thing that we learned from this. You know, it's not like we need to reinvent the entire field <clears throat> now that neural networks are a thing again. Okay, what else? Well, we did some other things um, involving unsupervised string matching metrics where we would take uh, messages and kind of do a what's called a locality sensitive hashing uh, pass on them to get them into a fixed bit vector that describes the characters and the words that are seen within the tweet. We measure the distances between those bit vectors and the idea is you, you change a couple of characters in the tweet and the bit um, vector will change very little which means that we can kind of do these uh, Hamming similarity computations very efficiently and quickly and come up with an idea of how similar the strings are. Okay, that's exciting, but not worth getting too into. We also used uh, pretty heavily in a lot of our systems these uh, word embeddings. Uh, actually, next week I see that Thomas Mikulov, who is the author of the pretty famous word to vec package, he's going to be talking here. So come, if you find this stuff interesting, come back next week and learn about what he's doing nowadays because it's undoubtedly had a pretty big impact on the entire field. Um, essentially, in, in a nutshell, for those who aren't familiar, the idea is that you're trying to take each individual word and give it a high dimensional vector representation such that similar words are very near each other in this high dimensional space. And so that you can learn in an unsupervised fashion from, say, 330 million tweets that we happen to have lying around, or the entire Wikipedia, or you know, whatever unlabeled text corpus you got. You can learn these word similarities in, uh, in you know, kind of a pre-training fashion, and then you can get some transfer learning from that to your task goal. So you see here that if you uh, train this thing on Twitter, and you ask it for what the most similar term to marriage equality is, then you get the hashtag marriage equality, you get gay marriage, you get same-sex marriage. This is going to be pretty crucial to solving the challenge that I laid out earlier, right? Um, and there's all sorts of ways that you can try and incorporate these features into a system, and we tried a bunch of those. So what do we do? Well, we did one uh, approach that was known to work well on news data, this nice grammatical um, English text that can be parsed into a nice clean parse tree and then you can take these word embeddings and you can kind of propagate them up the parse tree and you can say okay now we have a representation of this phrase and of this clause and of the entire sentence all at different levels of granularity you can compare and contrast across sentences and then you can say okay this you know tweet a has a phrase that is very similar to this whole clause over here and therefore it's a good match so we um, ran that stuff as one of our systems. And then we also did another machine translation trick, which is we took two sentences and we tried to align them together. So traditionally you do this with an English sentence and a foreign sentence, where you say, uh, I believe that this word translates into this other word over here. So now you can kind of imagine a process where you maybe you check off, okay, we've already accounted for this word in the foreign sentence, so don't try and translate it again. Or, you know, to speak very simply, we figured the same thing might happen in paraphrase detection. So let's see if the second tweet covers entirely the first tweet or if they have words that aren't well aligned. So we did some things with our word embeddings to see if that was the case. We could actually um, do it as a uh, linear programming uh, optimization where you maximize the total score of the entire sentence by choosing the right set of alignments with the highest individual sets of cosine similarities. Uh, so what does it look like? When you have a good alignment, so you see we've scored you know, all pairs of words uh, similarities to one another, and then we select a particular alignment. And we can tell, just kind of looking at this, like, hey, this looks like a really good alignment. It's kind of sequential. All the scores are pretty high. This is an easy case. This is like what we were really hoping to find. But then what happens when you see something like this? Uh, is that a good alignment? Well, I don't know. Do we want to have to sit down and write a bunch of rules about what is a good alignment, what's a bad alignment, or is there something that we can encode into uh, a, a machine learning process? So we tried a couple of things. One was to extract all sorts of you know, descriptive features about the quality of the alignments and things that we as people thought mattered. 
But then we also decided that we would go one step further and try out, you know, I guess deep learning is in our project's name, so let's actually put some deep learning into this, uh, this task. And more importantly, let's see if we can train up a recurrent system that's going to be able to model all these neat sequential aspects of language. So we know that, you know, if two phrases have overlapped, then we should see a, a nice long run of well-aligned sentence, of well-aligned tokens. And if it's not a good alignment, then maybe it's kind of all over the place. So that was the intuition. But we have very little training data, and we had very little um, ability to kind of generalize all the way to a, a, a true language understanding system. So that's kind of where we started with these alignments and then fed everything into a neural net. So this is just an example of what I'm talking about. We take each word pair and feed it as a set of inputs to our recurrent neural net. For those who aren't familiar with RNNs, the idea is that you provide inputs to them sequentially. So if you present the first input and it runs it through its filter bank and it produces a hidden state that kind of encodes what it knows about the sentence so far, and then you give it the next piece of information and it tries to wrap that into its hidden state and combine the first and the second, and so forth and so forth, until you get all the way to the end of the sentence and you've now created a model of the entire sequence and you can take that model and run it through a final classifier that says, yes, this is a good paraphrase, this is a bad paraphrase. That was the intuition. In terms of what features do we use, we used uh, a couple of descriptive statistics about the word embedding similarity, about the alignment um, kind of uh, distances, about the position in the sentence, some string features, those hashes I very briefly talked about. It's not super important kind of what was in this step, just um, the interesting thing to know is that it was far and away the most perf uh, performant system that we built. So when we took these things and evaluated them against the human expert's reference standard in terms of how well did our assessments of semantic similarity match the rankings that the expert produced, um, we found that the recurrent neural net was much more flexible with much less data than any of the other approaches we tried. As I mentioned, the, the string similarity plus a linear classifier also worked really well. That red dotted line ended up being second place in the competition. There were 19 teams, so um, you can get a sense for how well these systems did relative to the state of the art from uh, other people's labs. Um, so it was really interesting at this point to kind of take stock of what we learned. That was really the whole purpose of this. Is we, there's a lot of reasons why we want to do semantic similarity, and we weren't sure how far we could advance with neural nets versus a lot of other approaches that people had tried for other semantic similarity tasks in the past. And we found that the RNNs gave us a huge boost. So what do we learn? Um, we want those word representations that you're going to hear about next week from Thomas Mikulov. We also want some string similarity things. It's actually not so bad compared to human performance, which was interesting. If you, it turns out if you give a bunch of mechanical Turkers this task of deciding how similar two things are, they have a correlation with the expert of about 73% and our system ended up in the low 60s. So it's not that, we're not that far behind your average mechanical Turker, which is kind of exciting. Um, and maybe you know, one path forward on this piece of work is to build up a better unsupervised model of sentence composition so that we can build a, a better understanding component instead of playing all these tricks. And so that's kind of informing what we're doing in the future. But um, crucially, for the remainder of the talk, one, one thing that I want you to, to learn about why this is kind of such an interesting approach is that the network itself that was uh, very successful at solving this task is actually a really tiny neural net by standards of neural nets. If you're in the, um, the neural net deep learning kind of literature now, it's pretty common to find you know, a language model that has tens of millions of parameters or you know, weights that you can tune. And so if you want to set each one of those weights properly, then you're going to need a lot of data to, in, to build a network that um, generalizes properly with so many free parameters. In this case, we actually had a really small network. <clears throat> and that was only really possible because we had this massive pre-training process that gave us really good knowledge about what words were similar to what other words. And then we were able to encode some, um, some additional background knowledge about here is um, something that we know is important. So here's a feature that's going to be relevant to the network and, and maybe ask it to do something useful with it. So the exciting thing is that the, the best system in the world for semantic similarity with Twitter uses less than 100 individual units in the neural net and under 2,000 weights. 
And that's really important for a lot of things we're going to talk about soon, because once you start getting into neuromorphic architectures and biologically plausible architectures, you don't want to have to simulate millions of neurons and billions of synapses between neurons. And so if we're ever going to succeed in building neuromorphic systems that can accomplish anything functional, then it's going to need to be able to be compiled down into a, a, into a small uh, network that still generalizes as well. And so um, you'll see that a lot of that work leans pretty heavily on these distributed representations of semantic uh, contents in individual features, the word devec, the, the word embeddings, the, the different approaches for modeling semantics of words. Okay. Anyway, that's a long-winded introduction as to why it is that we care about recurrent neural nets. And uh, we're not the only team in the world that has discovered that recurrent neural nets are useful for language processing. It turns out that there's been a huge explosion over the last uh, year, two years, three years, in part because of the guy who's coming here to talk to you next week. Um, so one example of this is uh, with language modeling. So language modeling is an essential component of many different language technologies. It's essentially a system that aims to assign uh, probabilities to sequences of text, and you can use this to know if you've produced a sequence of text in a machine translation problem or a speech recognition problem that it turns out to be a really improbable one, and maybe one that you could, should reconsider because it's so improbable. And maybe this, you know, somewhere further down your list of candidates, you have one that's a much more English-looking kind of sentence, and so maybe you can bump up the, the, the likelihood of selecting that particular sentence as your translation. Um, in terms of language modeling, we've seen uh, astonishing progress over the last uh, handful of years by using recurrent neural nets. So you see here an example of a paper that was published uh, about a month ago that uh, compares a particular neural net formulation a bunch against a bunch of different neural nets that have been applied over the last um, two, three years, and also kind of the traditional uh, language modeling, uh, n-gram smoothing approach that had been kind of the best um, models until you know, 2012 when uh, Mikulov's uh, recurrent neural nets started to, to take off. And um, the, the key being that we could finally train them faster and on more data, because we've been trying to train these things for a long time. It's gotten to the point now where we actually had the, the right information and the, and the right computational power to train them. And look at these scores. I mean, so for those who aren't familiar with how you evaluate a language model, a pretty standard uh, technique is something called perplexity, which is a, a way of kind of um, describing how much information is accounted for by your model and how much information is uh, kind of left to the, the random chance. So a perplexity of, uh, say, 140 means that at each position in your, in your next uh, prediction, you, there's, you've narrowed it down to maybe, on average, 140 uh, choices, roughly. Um, and you know, there are some places where I could give you a sequence of words and you know exactly what I'm going to say next. And there are some sequences where you need to know something about what's in my head or what I'm trying to communicate to you to make a good prediction. So there are areas where when you're listening to me, your language model can fill in a lot of the gaps. And there are areas where you're hoping to actually learn something informative, I hope. Um, and as a result, the perplexity there is going to be a lot higher. So you want a language model that captures as much of this information about how language works as possible so that you can then just kind of learn the, the relevant bits as you need them. And you see that the scores um, on a particular data set that's kind of well studied used to be in the 140 range about uh, three years ago, and they're all the way down into the high 70s at this point. And this is mind-boggling. I mean, language modeling does not traditionally <laughs> advance by, you know, 70 points of perplexity at a time on a, on a data set. So this is kind of something that's got a lot of people excited um, and is potentially pretty uh, interesting uh, in terms of what we can do with it. Uh, what can we do with it? Well, it turns out that if you read Twitter and follow any of the people who are interested in deep learning, you probably saw about a million um, examples of people training these demos where you would train a language model and then attach a random number generator and ask it to generate some text that kind of fits the, the, the model. And, you know, this isn't like a novel idea. We've been doing it, you know, it's like uh, Python 101, you know, build a dictionary and generate from it. But um, it's pretty interesting to see what happens when you train these language models on text, on characters, and then ask them to generate something that, say, looks like Shakespeare. And I don't know, if we have any Shakespeare experts here, 
you probably look at this and say, well, this looks like crap. But to the rest of us, I don't know, it looks pretty Shakespearean. There's, I can imagine some guy standing on stage and, you know, was, I and good with way and my furniture of the feist. I don't know, that sounds like Shakespeare, right? So it's kind of interesting. What else can you do? You could ask it to like read a bunch of scientific papers and then generate some LaTeX uh, code. And then, you know, maybe fix a couple of bugs here and there and compile it and generate some proofs that are completely and utterly meaningless. But they look good, you know? There's some symbols and some arrows and, oh, we've got a proof uh, under, <laughs> underneath the lemma. And, okay, it looks like you managed to grasp some of the relevant concepts involved in writing scientific papers. And I'm sure there's a journal somewhere that would accept this, right? So, <laughs> cool, okay. What else can we do with recurrent neural nets? Well, machine translation is kind of the holy grail for a lot of uh, natural language processing because there's so much information that's out there that is in foreign languages and there's so many people who are interested in kind of sharing that information across those boundaries and yet it remains really elusive because it's this process that generally speaking um, is more complicated than almost any other task that we ask our language processing algorithms to do because it requires the ability to understand two languages and the mappings between them. We've gotten pretty good, you know, relatively speaking, compared to where we were a couple of decades ago, but now we're starting to see that neural nets can be applied here too, and they're starting to change the ways that people think about translation in, in some cases. So it's not uh, yet known whether or not this is gonna be the, the solution that, you know, uh, finishes the job. In fact, I can safely say it's not uh, the only thing that is that can be applied here, but um, it's certainly a, an appealing and intriguing uh, option, and they've started getting scores that are comparable with state-of-the-art for very finely um, tuned systems that people have been working on for a very long time. So that's exciting. Uh, other kind of stupid recurrent neural net tricks. Well, uh, you can also do things like generate captions of images. And so you see here kind of the same uh, process that was generating text uh, on the output side. You, you know, hook up a random number generator to your uh, character-based language model or your word-based language model, and it learns what image captions should look like. It also needs to model an image, and sometimes deep learning is good at that, and sometimes it's bad. So you see kind of progressing from left to right examples of worse and worse captions. But the interesting thing to note is that when you, when you read these uh, captions on the right, you know, that top right one, which is a, a street sign with a bunch of stickers on it, and it says a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks, it's like, well, you, we, the, the dangerous thing is that these, these things produce text that is grammatical and said confidently, right? So, you know, you could imagine um, a system that used to do this type of work might have just present, uh, in the past, created a sentence that said something like, food, sign, refrigerator, drink. And you're like, well, that's obviously wrong because I don't know what that means. But now you look at these things and you think, oh, a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks, that sounds like a real caption, maybe it's right. And so it's kind of this dangerous space where the computers are kind of bluffing their way through um, the task by using their language model, which can be trained very well on lots of unsupervised data. And so it's kind of a risk for our field that we don't end up um, causing people to make decisions based off of very uh, inconclusive analyses of the data. But that's neither here nor there. That's more of a, a, a task for the end users to figure out. Uh, okay, speech recognition also benefiting enormously from recurrent neural nets. So if you read any of Google's uh, blogs from the research team, you'll basically, every week or two, you'll see. And then we replaced this component of our architecture with a recurrent neural net, and then scores went up. And then next week, they'll tell you about, you know, the acoustic model got replaced. And over here, the, the translation models. And so it's kind of, um, it's pretty clear that the companies that have lots of data and lots of computational firepower are benefiting the most from deep learning because they have the ability to train up these really powerful uh, networks that can encode really complex functions and, uh, and actually train them to generalize well. Okay, so the bottom line is everyone it loves recurrent neural nets. Problem is solved. Let's all just go use recurrent neural nets. Who needs to do anything else? We're all done, right? I think that's, is that how it works? No? Well, okay. Even so, there's some cool things we can do with them. But so why exactly haven't we been doing this forever? Why did we, why did we try all these other stupid ideas that weren't recurrent neural nets? You know, uh, well, it turns out it's because they didn't work for, very, for the most of our history. So it's because these powerful frameworks 
require tons of computational firepower to churn through tons of data, and we just didn't have the technology that made it possible to take advantage. And we didn't have all the data available to us either. There's kind of been a, a revolution in language in terms of just the amount of data that's available to us now, you know? That I could go download Wikipedia instead of having to buy Encyclopedia Britannica and have someone type it into a computer. That I can just go connect to the Twitter API and download tens of billions of tweets for free and understand what people around the world are saying on things. So there's more data, there's more computers, and it's pretty exciting. You know, you can now get a system that has like 12 high-end GPUs in it, a, a maximum, <clears throat> you know, kind of theoretical peak performance of over 60 teraflops. That's the kind of thing that used to be a nuclear, you know, like a state secret, you know, in, a couple decades ago. That would have been the most powerful computer in the world, and now you can stick one on your desktop so long as you have enough cooling and electricity to make it work. So that's kind of where we're going with the rest of this talk is, well, what is the catch? Um, I saw this tweet from one of the engineers at Google, and I, I got a kick out of it. Product idea for a GPU-powered sous vide cooker, which pays for itself in mine bitcoins and runs deep learning and makes delicious food all at the same time. <laughs> Who wouldn't want one of those things? And this is kind of this is the catch: is that we still have uh, systems that um, are basically, um, you know, consuming vast uh, amounts of power just so that we can do simple things. So what do I mean by that? Well, okay, consider your uh, average smartwatch. So I don't know if anyone here has one, but you know, imagine you kind of say something to your watch and you're expecting it to intelligently uh, decode what you said and then do something useful with it. So what happens? You speak into your watch and the watch says, well, I don't have a GPU, I don't have a, a gigantic battery, so I'm gonna offload this processing to the phone. And the phone says, well, I don't have a gigantic battery and I don't have a really fast processor, so let's, uh, let's kick this up the chain. We'll send it over to the cell tower. The cell tower uh, obviously has to pass it on somewhere, I don't know, probably like outer space or something like that. And then <laughs> maybe that bounces back down and it goes to the Google data center and they, you know, beep and boop and churn through and they send it all back, all the way back the way it came and it gets back down to your watch and your watch says, um, yeah, you asked me what time it is <laughs> and it's, uh, it's 3.30. Uh, okay, great. And now you've just contributed like an extra fraction of a degree to the global warming. Thanks for that. You could have just looked at your watch. Okay, so this is terrible. We would really like to be able to look at our, you know, to do this processing on board in all sorts of places where it's not possible now. So we have to be connected to the internet at all times. Some companies might want that, but maybe there's some situations where you would prefer not to be and still get the benefit of all this cool technology. If only there was some way to understand speech and make critical decisions using lots of data that didn't require lots of power. And, well, let me show you the world's most efficient automatic speech recognition device. It's your brain. At the same time as you're sitting here listening to me talk, you're also like thinking about what you're going to have for lunch, what you did last night, what you're supposed to be doing right now, you know, what your advisor is going to make you do later. You're figuring out all these different strategies, and um, it's all consuming less than the screen that is projecting this uh, slide onto the wall. So there's obviously some enormous potential there that we haven't really kind of been able to bring into the, the realm of these uh, artificial neural nets and other types of processing that we tend to apply. So that's where we get really interested in this notion of neuromorphics. And this is where I'm going to do a brief recap of a lot of the work that actually happened this summer at the Telluride Neuromorphic Workshop um, with the help of a bunch of people in the room and uh, a much broader team of experts from around the world. So basically, as I'm talking about this, consider whether you might have something, uh, some area of expertise that's relevant here and um, because you've got some of the world leading experts here at this university and there's a lot of room to make a really big impact in this space. All right, so neuromorphic engineering at a very high level um, is this notion that we wanna design artificial systems with the same organizing principles uh, that we see in biological nervous systems. So there's this tantalizing um, you know, goal of having this low power, uh, excellent uh, a generalizing type of system and you know the first thing we might want to try is to mimic what we can model in the real world now the thing about that is there are some processes that are really um, that are really difficult to to observe and some processes that are a little bit more easy to observe 
So for the history of neuromorphic processing, we've certainly seen a lot more attention devoted to the ones that are easier to observe. So you can imagine sticking an electrode into an optic nerve and waving something in front of an eyeball and saying, oh, this uh, cell spiked at this time, and, I, and then learning to uh, replicate that type of behavior in silicon. And you can actually see some really cool systems that do exactly this. Uh, the Davis uh, cameras, for example, um, from Toby Delbrick's group. And uh, these, these are things that you can hook up to a computer and s watch spikes come off um, and kind of observe motion and get these really cool uh, low contrast uh, types of signals that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do with a normal camera. And it's compelling, but it's not exactly what we're looking for here in language processing. Because with language processing, we're looking at this higher order reasoning component, this external worldview that needs to be brought to bear to understand a sentence um, in a way that is somewhat unique to language. And so we have this extra challenge where we're trying to understand intent um, rather than you know, control a device which has challenging properties to control, but maybe slightly more well understood. Um, so that's one of the interesting trends that I was seeing in neuromorphics is this uh, move towards cognition and understanding how information gets processed instead of um, you know, maybe the, the raw inputs. And it's, it's a pretty exciting time to be in the field, and it's certainly because the field is advancing pretty rapidly. Uh, in terms of the Telluride workshop, this was a revelation for me, and I think there are probably a lot of people in the room who should know about it who haven't had a chance to learn about it yet. But it's actually been going on for 21 years now, and it's hosted in Telluride, Colorado every summer. It's a three-week, very intensive workshop that brings together experts from all around the world, uh, but certainly plenty from Baltimore, uh, University of Maryland, and uh, Johns Hopkins are uh, very well represented there and uh, have a pretty big impact on the, the research that gets done there. Uh, Ralph is uh, one of the directors and uh, certainly has, have you been there how many years now? That's amazing, yeah. So this is, uh, this is something that's kind of in your backyard and maybe uh, is, 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 is worth a look. And Andreas as well certainly has uh, a pretty big impact on it and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, this year, there were four different working groups that kind of, you get there and you self-organize a bit into different interest topics. And uh, I was there, of course, on behalf of the natural language processing one, being a natural language processing guy. Um, but we had people from uh, lots of different fields. We were, they were studying things like robot vision and uh, understanding how to interpret manipulation actions that people take just by observing. They were studying things like decoding of EEG signals. So how do you, if I stick a, uh, EEG sensor on your head and then uh, play some videos at you. Can I decode what you're hearing or, or thinking or paying attention to? The answer in some limited cases turns out to be yes, which is terrifying and awesome. Uh, you see all sorts of things that have to do with specialized hardware, which is certainly an area where uh, Hopkins excels. And, um, and then, of course, the natural language processing. So as it turned out, we, did, we had a lot of collaboration between those last two groups, and the stuff I'm going to tell you about today were examples of getting language processing running on some of the specialized hardware that exists to simulate uh, neuron processes and, and, and brain-like processes. All right, the other reason why you should probably want to go to Telluride is because this is what it looks like. So, I mean, if that doesn't sell you, then I don't know what to tell you. But it's set in one of the most uh, beautiful places in the world. That schoolhouse uh, nestled down in that canyon is pretty incredible. You get, here, here are the other views. There's the downtown. Um, there's the view from up on top of one of the hills. Uh, be very careful if you go not to go hiking with this fellow named Shiab Shama, who is one of the most incredible badasses uh, out on the trails that I've ever seen. Um, he might accidentally kill you. But otherwise, it's a wonderful experience to learn this the hard way. Really enjoyed it, though. Uh, it's also, it's kind of been a fixture in the town, which is pretty amazing. So they, they ask us to participate in the 4th of July parade, which is a really neat experience. And so we made some, you know, brain float out of balloons and paraded down and it was incredible. I'm just going to zoom in here so you can see this is, uh, this is, this is the Hopkins influence. Uh, pretty, pretty exciting place to be, as you can tell. Uh, Andreas doesn't look super impressed, but Ralph and I are definitely... <laughs> excited and and you can see the the robot is definitely uh engaged so pretty pretty cool environment um all right so that's uh that's kind of the foundation for a lot of this work is just collaborations that happened almost ad hoc at this workshop and it was pretty interesting to see how it could go 
Um, really quick, uh, since I'm asking you guys to learn some things about language processing and uh, neuroscience and kind of the intersection of all of them, just really quick, uh, you should know the basic anatomy of a cell in case this isn't something you come across. You got neurons that are sending little spikes of information down along axons, which travel through synapses, which hits dendrites, which hit the next cell. There's all sorts of different levels of granularity at which people can try and simulate this stuff. So you could imagine wanting to get to the point of simulating individual proteins interactions with nearby proteins. Um, or you could imagine kind of abstracting up a little bit to the point of just kind of signals between cells or even further, which is what artificial neural nets do, which is just kind of say there's information propagating through uh, vast layers. I think the, the, the sweet spot for practical application right now tends to be down in that middle layer where you're trying to simulate maybe uh, the information flowing between individual cells, but without necessarily um, getting into the, the specifics of the physics. But it turns out you can do some really, really cool things if you get into that level. So don't discount it entirely. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. In terms of the actual physical system that we were working with at Telluride, there, there are a number of different ones. There are actually a couple of different um, chips that were available to us there. But the one that we uh, worked most strongly with in the language processing group was the IBM chip. And this is something that's kind of been generating publicity um, over the last year. It's a uh, chip that is, was originally developed with funding from DARPA and uh, aims to do things like, um, it, well, it aims to simulate a million neurons using uh, 4,096 cores and about five and a half billion transistors. So in terms of the, you know, the silicon and the raw uh, processing power that could be available to this chip, it's kind of comparable to a modern GPU, but it's arranged in such a way that it is doing a completely different type of computation. It's doing, um, each, each core is simulating 256 individual neurons and then uh, the, the synapses between those neurons and 256 other cells. And they can send, they only communicate to one another through uh, small spikes of information. So they're simulating what are called integrate and fire neurons. The idea is a neuron can sit there and listen for information along its various synapses to um, that incoming spikes will arrive. And at some point, the cell needs to say, I've seen enough, and I've decided that I'm getting excited by this input, or I am not. And it, you know, based on that kind of uh, internal threshold, will decide to spike some number of times itself and pass this information on. So the question then becomes, what exactly can we do with this type of computation, which is very different from the uh, ways that we propagate information in modern artificial neural nets? We'll talk about that. But um, the compelling reason to do so is because when you have these networks that are communicating with very small spikes of electricity, where maybe many of the cells in your network are turned off for the majority of the time, and where maybe uh, the, the clock cycles are much slower than you would expect to see in a modern piece of hardware, you can actually use significantly less power than you would otherwise need to uh, compute the same uh, function. And so in terms of the True North system, they measure the uh, expected consumption of uh, a chip, all 4,096 cores going at full bore, uh, coming in at less than uh, almost like 1 19th of a watt, which is astonishing when you look at these uh, GPUs with similar amounts of transistors that are drawing, you know, uh, tens if not hundreds of watts apiece. Um, so that's kind of the exciting thing. There are huge downsides, of course, when you want to get into this space where you're re-implementing your hardware to fit into these spike-based uh, computations. And it's, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, as an outsider, I would kind of go and ask people what they thought. You know, what, so what, what gets, you know, what are you here for, and what are you most excited, and what are you most worried about? And the, the conversation that you overhear the most are people saying like. I don't know why we're doing everything in spikes. Sometimes you hear people say, I'm not sure what we're getting from it. Yeah, you can do this. And yeah, you can do that. But um, I think the, the, the most compelling um, reason to do things in spikes is because of this. It opens up this whole uh, area where, one, we can understand more about our brains. And two, there's this extra you know, massive benefit that you can imagine from having low power computation for a lot of information processing tests that are otherwise pretty important to um, the way that people operate online. Uh, like, do we compile the program like, every, get every that how many times you need to the and then how many times you 
Yeah, so the, so the way that you program one of these chips is essentially that. So there are choices that need to be made. And in some cases, you can choose to learn the parameters of this neural net in terms of when it should spike and how hard it should spike and all that. Uh, you can try and learn those using biological learning rules. And that's uh, powerful, but it's also really difficult to get anything useful built with it in context where you have a specific goal in mind and want to build a really complicated system. So what we do with this chip in particular, and maybe more broadly with this kind of class of idea, is we train something using a traditional artificial neural net, and then we take those weights and we transfer them into the synapses of our simulated cells and then ask them to behave according to the parameters that we've already learned can successfully solve a problem. But the challenge with that is that even just doing that with a chip like this is really difficult because you have um, much less precision to represent numeric values than we're used to seeing in almost any information processing task. So we're talking about encoding numbers using somewhere between one and four bits of precision, where a traditional floating point value is 32 or 64 bits of precision that can get you all the way up to eight or 16 you know, decimal places with you know, high fidelity. Um, you can't do that at all using these types of chips. And so you need to build your algorithm in such a way that's resistant to the noise that's introduced when you're quantizing your values into this very limited uh, space of possible um, ranges. The same thing with um, the integration time. So I told you each cell is listening for inputs and then decides to fire after it's seen enough information to know how strongly it's activated. Well, that takes time. So you have to decide how far out you're going to allow the integration to occur. And uh, at some point, you need to kind of chop it off, which means there's a maximum amount of activation that you can receive coming in. And that means that you have to, again, quantize your activation levels. So you know, with a, a traditional neural net, that's not necessarily a concern because you can get very precise uh, calculations so you know exactly how activated you are. But with these, you don't. So can we build something that survives in that arena and does something useful? Turns out the answer is yes. So what are the uh, hypotheses that we kind of went into this uh, task with? Um, one was this notion that it would be possible to learn some of the things that are crucial in language processing. I mentioned word embeddings or uh, these, you know, word to vec or these high, high dimensionality representations of words. We believe that it would be possible to learn something similar to that using a heavy learning rule. So that was something that we wanted to test because if so, that meant that we wouldn't feel dirty using the word vectors with reckless abandon in every other task that we wanted to solve. And as I mentioned, they're kind of the key to building a neural net that is compact enough to fit into maybe one core of a simulator. So if we could use the word vectors, then that meant we could get a lot of things done. If not, that would suck. So we had to make sure we, that it was biologically possible to even have something like that. And then after that, we needed to prove that we could um, see success even in the face of these, um, these high, uh, you know, these strong quantizations, these, these, these compressions of information into very small spaces. And, um, and to do that, we wanted to try using rectified linear units, which are sort of a, a good, a pretty good analog for these um, integrate and fire cells, because if you're familiar with uh, that activation function, it's basically not it's anything under zero is zero. After that, it's a linear um, function. And so this is actually uh, kind of surprising that they work at all in terms of uh, at, um, filling in for sigmoids and all the other types of nonlinearities that we've used to use in uh, artificial neural nets. But we thought, hey, it looks if we can train something, a deep neural net that uses ReLUs, uh, and we can do that in CAFE or with Python, then we can transform that into an integrate and fire and build something useful. So that's kind of what we went into this with. We had the goals of, as I said, building that, um, that online learning of a word co-occurrence matrix that's kind of similar to what word to vec is trying to learn. And we also wanted to prove that we could, if we could encode those things on a chip, then we could retrieve them and do useful things. So useful things to include um, the, the word similarity tricks that we often do with word to vec the word analogy tricks that we often do with word to vec and then things like classifying uh, individual words in terms of their, the way that they get used by people, or classifying entire sentences in terms of what do they mean and what type of 
um, response would be expected after someone says this to you. So, uh, spoiler alert, this totally worked. And it was kind of amazing how well it worked in a lot of cases. And um, I think it got a lot of us excited about maybe future directions for this work. So, okay, the first one, word embeddings. So, it turns out that word to vec, uh, for those who know it, is essentially doing something that is similar to a matrix factorization task, where the matrix in question is the full um, co-occurrence matrix of all the times that a word appeared within the context of some other word. So the idea is with language, you know uh, you can infer a word's meaning kind of by looking at the words that surround it. So if I tell you that I, I went to the blank and the blank is that word is a word that you've never heard before, you can infer a lot of things about it. It must be a place. It must be a place nearby. Maybe it's in Baltimore. Uh, and after you build up enough of these types of um, co-occurrence windows you, and statistics, you can then, with reasonably high precision, make uh, inferences about what a word means. The question is, could we learn this type of co-occurrence matrix using a biologically plausible learning rule, which is to say a Hebbian learning rule, not a backpropagation <laughs> learning rule, which takes a gradient and propagates it through many different layers using all sorts of illegal tricks in the brain. So, or tricks that would be illegal in the brain. So we need something that can, you know, the, the, the old way of saying it is uh, neurons that wire, fire together, wire together. So if something fires right before a downstream neuron, then you strengthen the connection between them. And we wanted to see if that was something that would be useful for language. It turns out, yes. Uh, we were only able to demonstrate it on a really small scale because it turns out that simulating you know, individual milliseconds of a larger process is very uh, resource intensive, but we were able to feed it Dr. Seuss and after a couple of hours, out popped this uh, synaptic weight matrix that defined how strongly uh, words were connected to other words. And if you kind of inspect these synapses and see which cells had similar sets of connections to other cells, that you could make really good um, predictions about what words appeared in similar contexts. So you feed it red fish, blue fish, one fish, two fish, and it figures out that red and blue are very similar types of words because they appear near the same thing. To a lesser extent, one and two are related um, because they also appear in that same context. And this is actually the full, uh, the full matrix that we computed. And you can see hotspots where uh, things are happening, like all the numerals uh, tend to be very similar to one another. And these are the same types of things that you see with word vec. So it's an exciting um, demonstration that we could, in fact, model this stuff in the brain and then use it everywhere we wanted to uh, for future tasks. So you, I also mentioned that quantizing uh, the word vectors and all the various stages of the computation was expected to be a huge problem. So that was one of the things that we had to explicitly measure, is uh, what happens to the information contained within a set of word embeddings when we start taking the values and compressing them into these smaller and smaller spaces. Now, I was actually really thrilled to hear that this was going to be important, because for the last couple of years, for unrelated reasons, my lab has been quantizing our word vectors. We figured, uh, again, there's, there's only so much precision you need, and there's a big trade-off in terms of memory consumption, disk storage. If you have a dictionary that has millions of embeddings in it, uh, you want it to f and you want it to fit in memory on, say, a cell phone, then you need to find places where you can throw away information. And we've been quantizing things down to 8-bit values for quite some time. And it turns out when you do that, you don't lose a lot of accuracy and ability to perform downstream tasks. So we knew that going in. And the question was, uh, could we go even ridiculously further down to the level of four bits of quantization, which is pretty ludicrous. You know, 16 different possible values at each position of the vector. Could we still conceivably represent anything useful? Turns out, the answer was yes. Uh, and one of the ways that you tend to evaluate these things is with um, by asking them to solve analogies. So, you know, the, in every paper that mentions word embeddings, you're going to see king is to queen as, as man is to blank. And uh, it, it's supposed to fill in the blank with woman, of course. Uh, and you can evaluate a set of word embeddings' ability to perform this task with addition and subtraction. And when you start with a set of embeddings that's trained on Wikipedia and is 64 bits, 64 length, but uses the full double precision um, floating points, you get a score in the high 40s. And if you compress it down into four bits and then constrain it even further to fit on the true north ship, which I'm not even going to discuss, but there's some weird things, um, then it actually only drops a fraction of a, uh, it drops about 3%. 
So that was exciting. It basically means that we can get these things onto the chip, and then we can ask the chip to do computations of you know, dot products so that we can figure out similarity between two words. So that we could do word similarity uh, recall. We can do these analogies. And so there's an actual demo where you can send a word into the chip, the right words get activated according to their similarity and then send out spikes, and you can read off these spikes and determine which words were most strongly activated. And this is really compelling when you think about how the brain works. When I say a word, you actually activate lots of other words that are near it in space. It's kind of the priming effect. And we know that people do this, and computers traditionally don't, and this is maybe one area where there's a, uh, an impending um, uh, closeness uh, between the two fields that we haven't maybe identified yet. So it's kind of exciting to explore that. We did some things where we wanted to test our ability to take these word vectors and then compute a function about them. And the easiest way to do that is with, um, a, traditionally, you know, a, a neural net that then is trying to predict some output variable. So we had to have lying around these uh, word uh, positivity ratings that were um, computed by uh, mechanical turkers. So, you know, the word happy is a very happy word, and the word terrorist is a very sad word, and there's, you know, you can assign a, a score to every word that you know. But they only had time to ask uh, people to do a few thousand of these things um, on Mechanical Turk, and then you just kind of, you know, that's your dictionary. So uh, we thought, well, what would happen if we used those labels to train up a neural net to interpret the word vectors, and therefore to learn some um, positivity ratings for the, any word you want to ask it about. You know, you could ask it anything that was observed on Wikipedia. And uh, it turned out that this worked. So it actually worked better than I would have expected. You could get up to an 80% correlation with human judgment. So it means that you can get these computers to make um, reasonable guesses about the, the, the semantic, uh, uh, I guess I should say, the sentiment content of a word to the extent that exists. Um, the question was, what can we get a spiking neural net to do? So we knew we could train an artificial neural net using this kind of train and constrain methodology that I was talking about, where we take this, the weight vectors and we transform them into synapse values and then load it onto the chip and let the chip fly. What happens? Well, it turns out that you can, in fact, um, simulate with pretty high fidelity uh, the, the computation that we were doing with the traditional deep feed-forward neural net. So you see, it depends on how long you allow this, each cell to integrate. So if you let it listen for up to a second, you are reaching uh, almost the exact level of correlation with the, exact, with the, the artificial neural net. And this is great, because we know we can do a lot with artificial neural nets, with feed-forward neural nets, with image processing, with language processing. If we can do that with these chips, then that is a gigantic win. So that was exciting to see. Um, I'm going to skip this. It's basically just what I said. Uh, and then the last thing that we wanted to try was this notion of recurrence. So I talked earlier about how recurrent neural nets are basically like your, you know, everyone's favorite toy for this month. And who knows what it'll be next month. But right now, we, we love recurrent nets, and we know that if we had a good uh, neuromorphic version of a recurrent net, that we could do something useful with it. And uh, so what we had to do was build a lot of those constraints into our RNN such that the quantization didn't kind of cause cascading error, that, such that the integration time wasn't um, so long that it, had, that it slowed us down to the point where it wasn't even a useful computation. And so this was kind of the biggest question mark, I think, that we had, was whether or not there was going to be anything useful that could conceivably come from this. And um, I'll spare you the, the specific details, but bottom line, we're putting together a paper. Uh, we find that it, with, with some caveats, the answer is yes, you can simulate a simple recurrent net so far, and maybe some complicated other types of neural nets as well, using neuromorphic hardware. And so that should get you real excited knowing what we can do with these things. I'll just show you one example, and this is probably going to be pretty hard to see given the, the room that we're in, so I apologize for that. But this is actually a picture of someone pointing at a different screen with bad resolution. But um, what you would see, if you could really see it well, is on the left-hand side are a bunch of individual neurons that are within the hidden layer of the recurrent net. And then there's a dot drawn um, forward in time every time that cell decides to fire. And then if um, the question up the top is, how many people died from bear attacks in Telluride? Because we happen to enjoy the particular misfortune of one of our Telluride uh, co-conspirators who came across a bear in an alley and nearly wet his pants. So, um, 
so we feed this sentence in as an input to uh, the neural net, and you watch its um, hypothesis about what type of answer is expected. In this case, it would be a number, right? So how many people died from bear attacks? Uh, some, the answer is a number, because we're just categorizing the question. Um, and what's really interesting is you can kind of watch its hypotheses change as different pieces of information arrive. So the word how is informative about a quantity, but it's also, it also could have been a question like, you know, how come uh, I can't uh, stay up after 9 p.m.? Uh, why doesn't my mom love me? Or, you know, how did uh, Columbus get across the ocean? Or there's all sorts of different types of questions that start with that. So you need more information. And so you can kind of watch the information kind of propagate through different hidden states and get some clues about what those hidden states encode. And it's really interesting because you can actually watch these networks learn to represent different semantic categories of information contained within these word vectors and then do something useful with it. So with the neural net that we were training, I mentioned it's a simple recurrent net. We haven't tried any of the really fancy stuff, uh, which is very popular right now. You know, LSTMs um, certainly are uh, powerful versions of recurrent neural nets, and you can do more with them. And it would be interesting to see if anyone succeeds in trying to encode that type of architecture in a neuromorphic um, setup as well. All right, in terms of where does this leave us going forward, um, I think it's in a pretty exciting place. It's clear that we can execute all sorts of language processing algorithms within the context of neuromorphic architectures, which gives us the ability to both learn about brains and also execute things in environments where we wouldn't have been able to do it before. Uh, the low power uh, idea is pretty compelling for a lot of different reasons. One is you could build, you can plug a bunch of them together and build these data centers that aren't heating up the planet. The other one is so you can stick it in your wristwatch and it can actually behave intelligently without having to rely on external resources. And um, really, I think the, for me personally, the most interesting um, you know, feature version of this technology is gonna be when we get to the point where we can implement speech recognition and machine translation and stick it in your ear and you can walk around a country and your hearing aid can tell you what people are saying. You know, the battlefish, the kind of, this, this, this is like the holy grail of, of language processing for, for decades and this is actually a path forward where it, it might even be possible in a, in a way that we never even dreamed um, it could be. So um, that's what I have today. Uh, I hope you learned about some interesting areas of potential collaboration within your own university and of course MITRE being a nonprofit research organization also enjoys collaborations with lots of universities. So if you found stuff that was interesting and appealing, uh, maybe we can work together too. Happy to take any questions if, uh, if you're not too eager to get out of here for lunch. Uh, yeah, in terms of the, the, so I mean, energy is definitely measured in terms of how much it takes to, you know, compute for a certain length of time. And yeah, absolutely, it will require more. That's a trade-off you can make. So that's kind of a, 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 exactly. And, it, and it's not just power, but it's also uh, response time is an important characteristic for a lot of algorithms too. So um, it might be that you need an answer within three milliseconds, in which case, uh, that's actually an advantage of neuromorphic processing is you don't need to wait for your entire computation to complete. You can take whatever your best current estimate is, which is continuously updating. Now, that's good in some cases and bad in others, and that's kind of something that people will need to decide on a task uh, situation. It's also true that you know the true north chip isn't the only chip that solves some of these problems, and people are going to be iterating and innovating on in this space for a while. So. Um, I think what's important is that we demonstrate that they can solve some of the challenges that we want them to solve. And then as people also improve hardware, then um, we can expect that uh, more things will become possible there. Uh, following up on that, the, uh, the Qualcomm Zero processors coming out soon, I believe, it's part of the Snapdragon chip. Is that something you, you're familiar with, or something you can compare and contrast with? No, I'm afraid not. Um, so, 
despite the fact that I just stood up here and talked about neuromorphic processing, uh, I am I, I came to this you know into this field less than six months ago, and it's been startling um, how much has been happening behind the scenes without my awareness of it, and how much we could get done with pretty limited investment. Um, I think there's a lot of exciting technology out there. Uh, probably people here at Hopkins would know more about it than um, than I might, but. Certainly interested in seeing where the field goes. No, no question. Well, so there's a couple of ways to answer that. One is that, I mean, the, a lot of times you have algorithms that for which the weights aren't necessarily firmly set. You might want to continue to tune as you are faced, as you experience new data. And that's something that's not supported on something like True North, although different architectures make it possible. So I think that um, in the future, it's something that will be considered when you're training these algorithms. Um, in terms of their ability to generalize to unseen inputs, which is kind of the, the key cornerstone challenge of machine learning, there's nothing in particular about neuromorphics or traditional neural nets that make them specifically well or poorly suited to it. It has more to do with kind of how you structure the, the network, how you structure the inputs, whether you're providing it with um, the types of features and the types of uh, parameters that it's going to need to do that generalization process without overfitting. So. In that sense, it's a, it's, a tr it's a classical machine learning problem. Overfitting is kind of the greatest plague to all computers, and these are certainly um, at risk of the same. But um, it's entirely possible that you could take advantage of maybe some of the unique features of this kind of hardware um, in ways that could, could benefit it. Thanks, everybody.